church, if you're watching online or if you're in person. You know what I just realized about that welcome video? Totally sounds like the intro to a sitcom. Anybody? It's like, welcome to church, you know? The new church sitcom. No? Nobody thinks that's funny? Okay, maybe it's just me. All right. Maybe, I bet you the, the people streaming are laughing. I'm just going to hope in that, that they're, okay. Well, hey, if you want to stand with us, we're going to uh, get ready to go into a time of worship. Um, we're going to go over a vision statement as a church and as individuals, though, because this is just so important to who we are as a church. Uh, so if you're watching online and it's your first time, or if it's your first time here in person, uh, this is really the DNA of our church. So we desire to be a safe place for people to be in process and a place where everyone realizes they are in process, none of us have arrived. Guys, I think we can all look into our lives and say, yep, we got uh, some steps to take, right? We're all working closer to Christ. That's our goal, to get more like him and uh, just allow God to, to lead us and guide us. Um, and we all have next steps to take. Nobody's like, oh, I'm, I'm there, right? It's really important to be humble in that way, and it, that helps your life just in general, <laughs> right? Well, let's pray, and then we're going to sing a couple songs, and then uh, we'll continue with our service. So, Lord, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. God, I pray that as we sing to you, you would come and inhabit our praises. God, that we would just be able to rest in your presence this morning. We would find hope, life, peace, joy, correction, everything that we need in you, Lord. So come and be with us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. 
extravagant it doesn't make sense we'll never comprehend the way you love us it's unthinkable only heaven knows just how far Lord, we stand in awe of your love this morning. It's unthinkable. It's extravagant. We'll never comprehend just how far you go. God, that you give up your only son. That you would literally sacrifice your own so that we could have a relationship with you. So that we could be adopted as sons and daughters. So we could have an eternal hope. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us to make us right. It wasn't because of anything we did. It was grace, undeserved favor. So now we can come boldly into the throne room of God. Covered in the blood of Christ. All of our sin has been atoned for, past, present, future. It is finished. It's extravagant. We're just thankful, God. Continue to meet with us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. All right, so here are the announcements for this morning. Number one, Pastor Rachel is switching her weekly Kingdom Kids videos to Tuesday morning. So go ahead and check the description or our website for more information on that. Also, if you would like a daily devotional called Our Daily Bread, we would love to get that to you. Uh, if you're online, just go ahead and fill out the online welcome form. If you're in person, go ahead and fill that out and we will get one to you as well. We also have some brand new process groups coming your way. The first one is DNA of Relationships. 
which will be taking place on Wednesday from 6.30 to 7.30. It's going to go for eight weeks, and it begins on July 22nd. The second one is called Finding God in My Loneliness by Lydia Broback. Um, that will be coming uh, soon this summer, so just keep your eye out for details on that. The final announcement has to deal with our next sermon series, which will be starting on June 21st. It's called The Blessings of Unity. The Bible teaches that the church is like a body. It's one entity with many different parts working towards the same goal. In this series, we will explore how can we have unity in diversity in our relationships. Thanks for joining us this morning again. See you later. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Awesome, awesome. Well, I am so excited to be here and to be with all of you. And I'm excited today because we are going to be talking about a super fun activity. And maybe you can tell by this bucket and by this rod that I have up with me that we're talking about fishing. How many people in this room have ever gone fishing before? That is quite a few people. You know what? If you are sitting with someone, I actually want you to take five seconds and tell the people with you what your favorite part about fishing is. Go. Awesome. Well, I heard a couple things, um, and I know there are some super fun things about fishing. Maybe your favorite part is being outside or being in a boat. Maybe it's eating delicious fish at the end of it. Maybe it's being with the people you love. But for me, I have one part of fishing that is my absolute favorite, and that is playing with the minnows and leeches and worms, playing with the bait. It is so much fun. It comes in this little bucket, right? And you can just pick up the minnows and leeches or watch them swim around or see the worms squirm. It is so much fun. And sometimes I even like playing with the bait so much that I don't even want to go fishing. I don't want to give it up. I want to play with it. It's so much fun. But the problem with that is if you hold on to the bait, if you don't cast it away, you will never catch a fish, right? In order to catch a fish, we have to take the bait, we have to put it on our hook, we have to cast our line, and then, and only then, will we get a fish, right? And so I think that maybe this could even be something that's kind of like when we worry. Now hear me out. So sometimes, just like the bait, how I want to hold on to it, and I want to keep it in my hands, right? And I want to play with it. But I need to be able to cast it away and to give it away in order for me to have fish. And in our Bible, it tells us that when we worry, we can cast that on God. We can tell God about our worries because he cares for us. And when we send our worries away, we'll receive help from God. We'll receive love from God. It's like our delicious fish, right? So I want you to think, kingdom kids and adults too, I want to think about what you're worried about. Maybe you're worried that you won't get to go to school in the fall. Maybe you're worried that you will never stop fighting with your siblings. There are a couple things you could be worried about. But our Bible tells us that we can cast those things on God. We can say, God, this is what I'm worried about, but I trust you. Will you help me? And when we do that, God shows us how much he cares for us and how much he loves us. So let's be thinking about that today and for the rest of this week. Well, Kingdom Kids, I'm so excited to see you on Tuesday morning. Remember, you can watch our video anytime throughout the week, but if you join me Tuesday at 11 a.m., then you can actually comment live on the video and interact with me and your friends. So I hope to see you all there. But for now, let's all join Pastor Amy in the Lord's Prayer. 
Good morning. Didn't she do such a wonderful, wonderful job casting all the worries upon the Lord? Well, it is amazing when you cast your worries upon the Lord. So let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you know that um, prayer is of utmost importance when we're going through these dark times in our lives? And God has the glory, he has the grace, and he has the truth for each and every one of us. So let's pray together. In Isaiah chapter 58, verse 11, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. He will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Lord, thank you for guiding me through this maze of life. Thank you for satisfying my soul and strengthening my bones. Thank you for your living water that quenches my inner thirst. I am fully satisfied in you, Lord. So please take the time to pray. So let's pray together. In Psalms chapter 119, verses 105, your word is my lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Lord, these are some dark times, and I need your light. Thank you that your word is my light. As I read your word, show me your path. So please take the time to pray. So let's pray together. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Lord, show me how I can minister to you through those around me, because whatever I did to the least of these, I did for you. So please take the time to pray. Lord, we just come to you today. We thank you so hugely for your light, for your grace, for your truth in these dark times. And only with you beside us can we get through it to the other side with you. So I just thank you so much for the wonderful things that are yet to be revealed. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. So good to see you again. Praise God. Well, today we're uh, concluding our series on um, stigma-free at CCC, and it's been so fun to be able to hear the testimonies of how God has used this series to help many people. And today I want to just conclude this series by talking about worry. Now, I used to be really good at worry. <laughs> I mean, it was almost as if I had a Ph in it. I mean, I was really good at worrying and stewing and fretting, and man, I could work myself up. And uh, I remember how it would be where I could literally, in my early 20s, it was like there was a hurricane going on within me. And I would have this nervous 
energy, and it would make it hard to relax. It would make it hard to just enjoy the present moment. In fact, in my early 20s, I went to see a, a doctor because I had stomach problems. And what I found out is that it was anxiety. And I could relate to the person who said the average person is crucifying himself between two thieves, the regrets of yesterday and the worries of tomorrow. Are you crucifying yourself by the worries of tomorrow? Now notice it says that worry is a thief, and I believe that. Think about what worry steals from us. A good night's sleep, enjoying our family, enjoying the precious moments God gives us. I want you to really think about that. What has worry stolen from you? You know, if some of us worried before this pandemic and were anxious, think about how much more we're probably worrying now. I remember last week talking to some friends at the service and they talked about the anxiety that they have been going through through this pandemic. And one person wrote, it's terrifying to learn that an illness such as COVID is spreading across the globe. The early stages of a pandemic can be anxiety producing. During that time, you don't know how widespread or deadly the illness is going to end up. And feelings of fear and anxiety and sadness and uncertainty are normal during a pandemic. So some of us before the pandemic wrestled with anxiety and worry. And this pandemic has only added fuel to our anxiety fire. Do you wrestle with anxiety? You know, it's been said that we live in the age of anxiety. What are you worried about today? What if I lose my job? What if I get the virus? What if I lose my retirement? What about all this unrest going on in our country? I mean, it just kind of seems like things are kind of out of control. Are you wrestling with worry and anxiety today? You know, someone has said that People who do not know how to fight worry die young. How many people has anxiety and worry led to a premature death? Someone has said that it's not so much what we eat, it's what's eating us. So what is worry? This is one definition, a state of anxiety and uncertainty over actual or potential problems. A state of anxiety and uncertainty over actual or potential problems. Now, when it comes to anxiety and worry, like we talked about last week, there are different degrees of depression. There's also different degrees of anxiety. In fact, Nami writes, everyone experiences anxiety. However, when feelings of intense fear and distress are overwhelming, and prevent us from doing everyday things, and an anxiety disorder may be the cause. Anxiety disorders are now the most common mental health concern in the United States. An estimated 40 million adults in the U.S., or 18%, have an anxiety disorder. Approximately 8% of children and teenagers experience the negative impact of an anxiety disorder at school and at home. So, I mean, all of us deal with some sort of anxiety, but if the Anxiety is overwhelming. If the anxiety is impacting how you live, I would encourage you, as we've been talking about in this series, is just go to your primary care physician and talk to them about it. So what we're going to talk about today is how do we flatten the curve when it comes to anxiety? How do we break the worry habit before it breaks us? How do we overcome worry. Now, the reason this is so important, and again, I hope you hear my heart, the reason this is so important is because worry and anxiety is a thief. I've said that before, John 10.10. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. Right? Jesus says, I've come that you may have life to the full. Worry and anxiety robs us of that. In fact, does anyone remember Pac-Man? Remember that? You can raise your hand. It won't date you. Yeah, those of us from the 80s, yes. Okay. 
So think about little Pac-Man. He's kind of a little C there, and I call that the Christ life, and that's the full life that God has for us, and we're just going along and, and, and feeding on his word. But then these ghosts of worry and these ghosts of anxiety are seeking to destroy us. And how do we overcome worry? How do we break the worry habit? Well, today what we're going to do is we're going to look at a text from the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to talk about what it teaches us about how to overcome worry. Now, before I read this text, I want to remind you that Jesus gave this message out in, in, in nature. And what's interesting is I read it, notice how he'll say, look at the birds. There's probably a bird flying over, you know, a, a Canadian goose or something. And then he looks, goes, look at this flower. So remember, he's reading this outside. So this is some of my favorite parts of the Bible. And just, um, I want you to, just let this minister to your spirit. That is why I tell you not to worry about your everyday life. Now, I want to stop right there and just say this. If we're worrying, we're disobeying God. Because he tells us not to do it. Whether you'll have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. Look at the birds, he probably said. They don't plant or harvest or store in barns. But your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Now, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. So think about it. If God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow... Won't he care for you? <laughs> Why do you have so little faith? Now notice how Jesus links worry to a lack of faith. So don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. And your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. So Jesus is telling us what not to think about. So what are we to think about? Verse 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Above all else. Live righteously, and he'll give you everything you need. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Wow. What a treasure chest when it comes to overcoming worry. And what I want to do for the rest of the time is I want us to just kind of dive into that text and see what it teaches us about how to overcome worry. And I put my four points all in the letter F because I want you to get an F when it comes to worrying. <laughs> okay, I want you to not be good at it. All right. So the first thing is faith. And basically what we're talking about here is trusting God to provide. Jesus says in verse 25, that is why I tell you not to worry about your everyday life. Whether you'll have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? And what Jesus is getting at is that when we have faith, we just trust God to provide. Now, how does God provide? Sometimes we can have an erroneous view when it comes to this, and we kind of have the mindset, well, I just need to sit back and lay on the couch, and God will provide, right? I, I don't need to do anything. God will provide. We can, I call it pious irresponsibility. And Jesus says, look at the birds. Now, let me, are any bird watchers here? Anyone? Raise your hand, okay. Do birds just sit and wait for the worm to fall into their lap? No, they actively seek it. And the point is, is that when it comes to God providing for us, we have a part. And our part is to use prudence. Our part is to do our prayerful best. Our part is to fulfill our responsibilities and trust God to provide. Someone said it this way, pray as if everything depends on God and work as if everything depends on you. And there's that balance of prayer and work. And I just want to encourage you to, to think about, are you on a ditch in either side? See, one ditch is the pious irresponsibility. Well, I don't have to do anything God will provide, right? I just have to um, just sit on the couch, eat Doritos, and watch TV, and God will provide. That's pious irresponsibility. The other ditch 
is practical humanism. And we act as if it's all up to us. If, if it's to be, it's up to me. There's a ditch on both sides, and we want to come to the middle, and that is where I do my prayerful best to fulfill my responsibilities and then trust God to provide. Now, biblical scholar William Barclay says, the Jews themselves were very familiar with this attitude towards life. It was the teaching of the great rabbis that life ought to be met with a combination, watch this, of prudence and serenity. They insisted, for instance, that every man must teach his son a trade. For they said not to teach him a trade was to teach him to steal. That is to say, they believed in taking all the necessary steps for the prudent handling of life. But at the same time, they said, he who has a loaf in his basket and says, what will I eat tomorrow, is a man of little faith. Jesus is here teaching a lesson which the people knew well, the lesson of prudence and forethought and serenity and trust combined. Here's how I summarize it. I will do my prayerful best to fulfill my responsibilities and trust God with the outcome. Would you read that with me? I do my prayerful best to fulfill my responsibilities and trust God with the outcome. The Bible says that the horse is made ready for battle, but victory belongs with the Lord. Now, the second way to overcome worry is Father. And basically what Jesus is saying is that we have this heavenly Father who cares for us and who loves us, and he's watching over us. And you know, you think about a, a human father, and next week is Father's Day, and you think about a human father who cares for his children and loves his children. And, and that father, no matter who he is, is fallen, is, is not perfect. And we have a perfect heavenly father who is watching out for us, and we can trust him. In fact, in Luke chapter 11, Verses 11 and 13, he says, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you, though, then you're evil, know how to give gifts to your children, watch this, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You know, if you think about the Lord's Prayer, it says, Our Father, right? Did you know that that word is actually Abba? Papa, Daddy, I just want to encourage you that when you're anxious, just pray this prayer. Abba, I belong to you. Abba, Papa, I belong to you. You know, one of my favorite pictures of our dogs is when they were younger, the, the two puppies, and uh, they're a lot bigger now, okay? But this is Papa Bear. He's the older bear. And just see how they're snuggled up next to him? And it's kind of like, you know, if we're around Papa Bear, we're going to be okay. And I want to encourage you that don't waste your time worrying. Invest your time worshiping. Don't waste your time worrying. Invest your time worshiping. What is worship? It's getting close to Papa. It's getting close to Abba. Now, notice I said that worry is a waste of time. It is. That's one of the things Jesus talks about in this verse. In fact, in one translation, it says, Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Now, a cubit is from your elbow to your top finger. And Jesus is saying, When you worry, do you add a cubit to your stature? No. His point is, worry is a waste of time. So here's an uh, experiment. I want you to go home today and, and write out what you're worried about. And then put it in a drawer and come back to it a year later. And do you know what you'll find? The majority of things you worried about never happened. Like Michael Montney said, My life has been filled with terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. <laughs> they happen up here, right? In fact, there was a, a study down, done, and they, they looked into what people worried about, and 85% of what they worried about never happened. And of the 15% that did happen, 79% of it, they handled it better than they thought they could, or they learned a very valuable lesson. So the lesson is, is that 97% of what we worry about is a waste of time. So I want to encourage you not 
to worry, but to worship. Those of you who are listening online, don't waste your time worrying. Invest your time worshiping. Now, the third way to overcome worry is first. Jesus says, don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Now, notice this. These things dominate. It's not just a passing thought. Dominate. The thoughts of unbelievers. But your Heavenly Father already knows your needs. Okay, so we know what's not to dominate our mind. What is to dominate our mind? Verse 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. What does the kingdom of God mean? The rule and reign of God in your heart. When God is reigning in my heart, not just when he's um, the resident, but he's the president of my heart, the kingdom of God has come. Seek the kingdom of God and live righteously, and he'll give everything you need. Now, what I'm about to say is so important. Jesus is saying there's two approaches to life. The first approach is to live like an unbeliever, which is to nervously go around and, and focus on just providing for your needs. Well, I have enough. I hope I have this. And that's the focus. Or the other approach is to seek God first and to live righteously knowing that as you do that, you come under God's umbrella of blessing and he will provide for you. Let me say it again. There's two approaches to life, to just kind of um, nervously, I got to provide, I've got to do all this stuff, or focus on putting God first, living righteously, knowing that as you do that, God himself will provide for you. Now, Matthew 6.33 is a very special verse to me. When I was in my early 20s, a couple years ago, um, what's so funny, <laughs> Sean? What? Um, anyways, let me start over. So Matthew 6.33 is an important verse to me because when I was in my early 20s, uh, I was searching. I was drifting. I, I wanted to be married. I wanted to have a career, but none of those things were on the horizon. And I was kind of pursuing those things. And I remember going to church one day and my pastor spoke on Matthew 6.33. And basically what he said, and the Holy Spirit just used this message to really transform my life, is he said, don't seek after those things. He said, instead, pursue God with all your heart. Put God first. Live righteously, and then he'll take care of those things. And I remember leaving church that day saying, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is pursuing Christ and living righteously. And I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just focus on pursuing God. I'm going to focus on building my love relationship with him. And it wasn't too long after that that I met Tammy and was called into ministry. And that's what I want to encourage you to do today is put God first, seek him first, and he promises to take care of all the rest. Now, one of the reasons it's so important to put God first is because left to our own, we often pursue things that are unimportant in light of eternity. Only one life, it'll soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. In fact, notice in verse 29, it talks about Solomon's robe. It says, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And then notice it says, if God cares so wonderfully for the flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow. Now, some biblical scholars say that the flowers that Jesus were pointing to, some of them would have been an anemone. And I don't know if I'm saying that right, but they were purple. And the ancient audience would have connected the purple flowers with Solomon's robe. And Jesus says, they're thrown in the fire. And what Jesus was getting at is that often the things we worry about are unimportant in light of eternity. In fact, what are you worried about today? Let me ask you a question. When you're in eternity 200 years from now looking back, will what you're worried about today matter? Doesn't it say when we've been there 10,000 years? If it doesn't matter 200 years from now, why are you worried about it today? So how do we put Christ first in our life? Warren Wiersbe, a well-known Bible commentator, says this. How do believers today practice Matthew 6.33? We start with our time and put God first every day. This means time for prayer and reading his word. Taking time to just connect with the Lord. Taking time to read the word and, and pray and talk with God. Guys, 
Christianity is a relationship with Jesus. It's not a religion, okay? And any relationship you want to build, you need to spend time communicating to them. Amen? So you start off every day communicating with the Lord. We'll put God first in every week, attending the house of God faithfully. We'll put God first every payday, paying our tithe to the Lord. We'll put God first in our choices, making no decision that would leave God out. All right, so how do we overcome worry? The final thing is focus. And I love this. Jesus says, So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Do you ever ruminate about tomorrow? Do you ever stew and fret about this week? Maybe it's a presentation you have to give Monday, or maybe it's a doctor's appointment on Thursday, and you're not really engaged in the present moment. Your mind is somewhere else. You ever driven home and thought, wow, I have no idea. I don't remember driving home. <laughs> but you're not engaged in the present moment. You're worried about tomorrow. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. Live from now until bedtime. Live in day-tight compartments. Did you know that a day of worry is harder than a week of work? A day of worry, someone said, is harder than a week of work. Jesus is saying, live in day-tight compartments. Someone said, every day brings its own problems. To worry about them only doubles them. Now, as human beings, we have the ability to do something called projection. We can project ourselves into the future, and we can kind of um, project what we think is going to happen. But can I tell you something? None of us know the future. Amen? So to practice that really is a waste of time. Only one person knows the future, and that is the Lord. Don't waste your time worrying. Invest your time worshiping. Now, in the Lord's Prayer, what do we pray for? Do we pray for next week's bread? Is that what we pray for? Do we pray for next year's bread? Is that what we pray for? No, what do we pray for? We pray for what? Today's bread. I want to encourage you to live in the moment, okay? It's a gift. That's why it's called the present. <laughs> um, I thought that was good. But uh, anyways, um, so... Um, I remember reading a quote once that said that when we're, we're truly happiest is when we're focused and engaged in the present moment. Let me ask you a question. Even right now, are you engaged right now or are you thinking about what you're going to eat when you're out of here? Are you, gonna think, are you thinking about engage in the present moment? Live from now until bedtime. I'm going to invite Cameron to come forward and I, I'd just like you to just bow your heads for a moment and, and, and just pray this prayer. Those of you who are watching online, pray this prayer. Those of you who are in person, Lord, help me to not waste my time worrying. Help me to invest my time worshiping. The Bible says, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guide your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Lord, as my friends and fellow followers of you are praying, you said that as we hand this stuff over to you, you'd give us a peace. I just pray even now that your peace would fall upon us. I pray that your peace would fall upon our nation. I pray that your peace would fall upon our country and our homes and our community and our country. Now, we're going to put four prayers up on the screen. And they're based on the four Fs because I want you to fail at worrying. And... Which one of these prayers does the Lord, is the Lord speaking to you about? And I want to encourage you to take this prayer with you this week and pray it over and over. The first, first one is the faith prayer. Let's pray that together. Lord, as I fulfill my responsibilities, will you provide for my needs? Remember, there's a ditch on both sides. Pious irresponsibility, practical humanism. We do our part and trust God to provide. 
the Father prayer. Let's pray that one together. Lord, since you are my Father, I trust you to meet my needs with fatherly care. The next one, the first prayer. Lord, as I put you first, please take care of my needs. Two options. One is to be nervously, how do I take care of this? How do I provide? The other option, put God first, live righteously, knowing he will fill in the rest. The focus prayer. Let's pray this one together. Lord, help me to live one day at a time and leave the future into your hands. Would you just bow your heads? And I just want to um, talk to those of you who are online and those of you who are in person. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? I'm not talking about knowing about him. I'm not talking about even going to church. I'm not talking about rules and rituals. I'm talking about a relationship with a person. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? And, and maybe today, as you've been experiencing this service, there's a voice in your heart that is saying, come to me. Let's do life together. And I believe that that is the voice of Jesus. And some of you are saying, Steve, I want to become a follower of Jesus. I want to um, live a, a life of belonging and believing in him. You say, what do I have to do? First of all, you have to admit that you're a sinner. You have to admit that I've fallen short. I've broken God's law. We can justify, we can make excuses, we can blame. But the starting point of the good news is the bad news, which is I need God's grace. I've fallen short. Next, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you put your faith in what he has done for you on the cross. That on the cross, Jesus Christ died for your sins. And God placed on him our sins. And when we put our faith in him, see, his grace is extending to some of us today. And we reach out and receive that grace through faith. And then next, we change through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit redecorates our soul. He fills us with the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, mercy, and self-control. Let me ask you a, Christian, a question. If you were convicted for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Let me ask you again. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? When Jesus comes into your life, there are different fruit. There's different you live differently. You're not perfect, but there is a change. Jesus is not only the resident of your life, he's the president of your life. If that's you today, if you want to just surrender your life to the Lord, if the Holy Spirit is knocking on the door of your heart, just pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord, forgive me of my sins. Oh God, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. I invite you to be the leader of my life. I surrender. I surrender control. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Lord, I just pray that you would help us to trust you with the deeper dimensions. Lord, I pray that we would not waste our time worrying but we would invest our time worshiping. And I pray for a peace which transcends all understanding. Like a hurricane, there's an eye, a peaceful center that when everything around us just seems to be chaos, there's a calm center because you are there. God, thank you that when we have peace with you, we'll have the peace of God with us. I pray for peace, peace, Lord. May your peace fall upon us. We love you, Lord. We ask this in your name. And everyone said...
Amen. Amen. Well, hey, we're going to share with you a, a testimony um, of what the Lord has been doing in Maria Popular's life. And I just want to thank her for sharing this. So check out this video. I didn't understand that I was worthy of people caring about me. So I really put on a smile and pretended that I was okay, but I wasn't okay. Um, so when I first also came into church, I got to meet Julene. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever had a chance to meet Julene, but she greets you with this warmth and smile. And then a couple of Sundays later, I met Pastor Amy. And when I saw Pastor Amy, I knew I wasn't going to be judged. And she had gotten up and talked about Healing Hearts Ministry and what it was and that they would start classes soon. And I thought, well, maybe I'd like to do that someday. Um, I really discovered just how much of a wreck I was, <laughs> which was a good thing. Um, I really wasn't okay. Um, Pastor Amy and I have had the opportunity to pray through a horrific childhood. Um, I did not know that I had bitter, the things that weren't right in my life are called bitter fruits. I did not know that it would just traced back to a bitter root and that it, I didn't understand when I first started coming here either that Christ could heal it all because he can all of the trauma. So I say all the trauma. What I mean is I was abducted three times before the age of six and I was beaten, sexually abused, raped by my real mom and her boyfriends when they were drunk and high. And I learned or formed beliefs that I was worthless. That no matter how I felt, no matter if I said no, that I was not a valuable person. That it was okay for people to walk all over me. And so I formed beliefs and behaviors around blaming other people. I judged a lot of people. I um, wanted to protect myself, put myself in a shell, and say, I can do it on my own. But the reality is, is you can't. You can't do it on your own. And when you're in your, my, I was in my protective shell, I was hurting myself and other people. I guess what I'd like to share with you is that through Healing Hearts Ministry, through Christ, using Healing Hearts Ministry and the ministers and Pastor Amy and CCC as a place and a vessel and a tool, all of us, myself included, Christ can heal us. We can pray out the trauma. We can get to the other side where we don't feel like we're drowning in our own stuff anymore. And you can have peace in Christ. I really felt like I had my act together, but I didn't. I was a wreck. Um, and I'm happy to be a wreck now. <laughs> I know that this healing through Christ and coming to Christ is a lifelong process. And it really began when I chose or felt led and chose to follow Christ by being baptized here at CCC um, and giving my life back to Christ. I learned that it's a lifelong process. I remind myself to literally lay myself back down at the cross because it's not about my timing. It's not about my will. It's not about how I want life to be because God has our plan perfectly planned out. We just need to be ready to listen and follow. <laughs> When I think at the whole process, and I'm going to read verbatim, you know, um, a lot of us just graduated as Healing Hearts Prayer Ministers, and I'm really, really reminded of this verse 
And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans chapter 8, 28. So what I have found in this whole process of baptism and Healing Hearts Ministry and being in community with, with our family here at church is that this is a lifelong process. It is okay to not be okay. It is okay to sit for an entire hour at the back of church and ugly cry. I've done that. <laughs> and nobody judges you. And it's refreshing that people actually care about you and that you are worthy. And we are so loved. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Maria, thank you so much for sharing that. What a blessing that is. And uh, thank you for the Healing Hearts ministers. And we are a place of healing. And, you know, I just uh, want to remind you that we're going to now worship the Lord through our tithes and offerings. And as you give, remember, you are making stories like that possible. There's a few ways that you can give today. First of all, is through our, our text giving to 507-204-7475. 507-204-7475. Next, there is our website. You can go to our website, and there's a, a box on it called Give. You can send it in the mail. Those of you who are watching online, to Community Celebration Church, 27337 County Highway 34, Casson, Minnesota, 55944. For those of you who are in person, there's some baskets out there. As you leave, you can place them in there. But let's remember that as we talked about earlier, this is not, uh, worship time is not just the singing part or the speaking part. This is a part of worship as well. So we worship God through our tithes and offerings. Next, uh, for those of you who are watching online, we want to let you know that there's a phone number that you can call, 634-7013, and there are people waiting to talk with you and to pray with you. You can also go on our website, and there's a, a box that's called prayer, and you can send your prayer requests that way. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us today, and I want to encourage you, as I said earlier, don't waste your time worrying Invest your time worshiping. I want to thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Now may you go in the grace and the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.